So this morning I said, you've already got a tickle in your throat, you may not be able to last long, don't sing. And then Russell picks these wonderful songs that I love to sing, and I couldn't help myself. And so I'm already a little bit uh, uh, strained, but we will make it through. Susie was a young lady, and uh, she was in the fourth grade. They were nearing the end of school. She was already starting to struggle a little bit. Some of the math problems were more difficult than she thought. And her mom was trying to encourage her. But Susie, you've got to finish the fourth grade to go to fifth grade. And she'd heard about fifth grade. And she didn't want to go to fifth grade. She told her mom that day, she said, But mommy, I, I, I'm not going to go to fifth grade. I'm going to quit school when I finish fourth grade. That's it. Her mom trying to encourage her said, Well, well Susie, what are you going to do with just a fourth grade education? I'm going to teach third grade. That's how a lot of us look at Christianity sometimes. We... We look at the fact that God is challenging us to grow, but at a certain point, we almost stop growing. It's, it's like we've arrived. We have finished the fourth grade, and we think, well, I can, I can at least teach the third grade right now. But you know, Christianity has always been a religion of growth to take us from one place and help us to grow and grow and grow. The Bible uses a lot of different imagery throughout uh, from beginning to end about how we are to grow for example it talks about how we are babes in Christ and yet we are to desire not just the sincere milk of the Word of God but later to chew upon the meat of the Word of God in Hebrews chapter 5 and so the the actual physical life is sometimes used to show how we grow and pace ourselves. But also athletic competitions are used to show how, you know, as we get into the uh, a boxing match or a wrestling match and how when, when we, we get in, we stay until the end. We don't quit halfway through. But one of, the, one of the interesting things in the Bible is the imagery of the potter and the clay. Think about this. In Isaiah 64, Isaiah is writing about some of the things that the nation had done. In fact, he, he starts talking to God and he says, I, Would that you would come into our presence again. God had left their presence because of their sin and because of their iniquity. And he admits how bad they had been. In fact, he, he says that, that their iniquity was so bad that he personifies sin. And he says, sin is like a person. And he's holding his hand out. And here we are, God. We are melting in the hand of iniquity. Because you've hid your face from us. Because God's presence was hidden from them by, by their sin. And he says in verse 8, You are are our father I hear those words of Isaiah and I immediately think of that relationship that I want with God the relationship that Isaiah evidently wants with God and even though he admits that that we as sinners and as this nation have left you that you are still our father we know where to come back to we know where home will always be it will be with you our father and then in the next phrase, he says, we are the clay and you are our potter. We are the work of your hands. And so there's this picture of us as clay and God as this potter. If you have your Bibles, turn to Jeremiah 18. So we pick up with Jeremiah in much the same circumstance, a nation which has lost its way and its identity with God. And it begins in verse... One, God says, The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will let you hear my words. So Jeremiah says in verse 3, I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, working at his will. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. And he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good. To the potter. When I was a child, my parents had a few friends that were potters themselves. I remember this one man by the name of Paul. Paul would uh, make cups and he made honey jars and pitchers and, and whatever it was. And, and I remember going to his workshop on a couple of occasions. 
bright lit, and here was this wheel, two parallel stone wheels connected by a shaft. And of course, he would throw his clay on the top wheel and he would spin the bottom with his feet. There was out in the backyard a brick kiln, wood kiln, where he would fire the pieces once they were finished. Once they, they came to shape as he saw, he would take them and glaze them and put them in the fire and they of course would cook or they would harden in there and they would bring them out and it was a cup or it was a, a bowl or it was a pitcher or whatever vessel it was that he was desiring to make. God tells Jeremiah, I want you to go down to the potter's house. I want you to witness the creation of a great vessel. I want you to see what it takes to bring that clay to life. Remember Isaiah's word, we are the clay, God, you are the potter. God is going to use this potter clay reference again with Jeremiah. But he wants Jeremiah to see firsthand, to stand at the potter's house. And here's Jeremiah telling us what he sees. He sees the potter with his hands dampened with water, working the clay and molding it into the shape that he, he wants. There is a vision. We may not see the vision of the potter in his mind, but we see the product of that vision as he continues to mold and sculpt and hold that clay while the wheel turns. But, but Jeremiah sees something interesting. The clay is spoiled. Something happens while the, the potter's vision is coming to life. Maybe the clay had some imperfections in it. There was an air bubble or something that was not needed out in the beginning of the preparation process and, and that bubble now has caused a hole to come into the side of the, pe or of the, of the vessel and so he's, he has to, to restart this lump of clay to rework it. So, so maybe it was an imperfection to begin with. Maybe it's an impurity. Maybe a small rock has got into the clay and it's been exposed in the, in the time of the making of the vessel. Or maybe it's some dirt or something that has caused this impurity to, to form or, or to be shown in the midst. Whatever it is, it is spoiled in the potter's hand. And so the potter, the potter is undaunted. He takes this lump of clay and he begins to reshape and rework it into something else. God says, in verse 6, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom, that I will pluck it up and break down and destroy it. And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I had intended to do to it. We think back to the nation of Nineveh when Jonah is called by God to be his prophet to a nation that did not know God. And he went to the city of Nineveh for 40 days walking through the streets of Nineveh proclaiming that God Jehovah is the Lord. That repentance was necessary in order for this nation to be saved. It was their only hope was to come to a knowledge and an acceptance of the Lord. God had intended that, that He was going to destroy this nation if they didn't repent. But at the prompting of Jonah, and even against Jonah's will, the nation repented. And God withdrew his hand, his intention, to destroy the city. In the next few verses, God turns it around. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it. God says, I, you know, sometimes I talk about the nation that I'm going to build it up. And I'm going to give it strength. I will give it prosperity. If at any time I speak of a nation that way, and of course, the nation of Israel was the product of that. He says, I will, and if at any time I, I say that I will do these things, and if it does evil in my sight, if that nation that I am, I am blessing and prospering begins to do evil and does not listen to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do to it. God says, my, my intentions were this, but if, if their attitude turned evil, or if the evil's nation turns good, then God would change His intention for that nation. Now therefore, say to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, 
Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Return every one of you from your evil ways and amend your ways and your deeds. God says, I have a new intention for the nation of Israel. I am shaping evil, destruction, pain. I'm going to bring this nation down. Yet if you will change, if you will become the better lump, then, then I will not destroy this nation. You know, the same is true for us as individuals. God has a desire for each of us to be saved. And the kind of clay that we are in the sight of God is going to determine what God will shape out of us. Whether we are vessels of destruction or vessels of honor, as the Bible talks about later in the New Testament. But we think about this first and foremost. The clay begins malleable. That is, that, that it's shapeable. As it spins upon the wheel and, and the, the hands are held in a certain way, it can be molded and shaped however the potter wants. It's the beauty of the clay when it's soft. And so it is with our lives. When we in humility submit to God and we say, God, control my life. God, take control and, and shape me into what you want me to be. So we sing in the songs, Thou art the potter and I am the clay. Hold over my being absolute sway. God, you have full control of my life. I give it to you. And as long as we are willing to do that, we will grow. We're soft. But if we ever reach that point in our lives where we think, Aha, I've arrived. I've finished fourth grade. I can teach third grade. I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for five years, ten years, fifteen years, fifty years, sixty years. I have nothing else to learn. I have no ways in which I can grow anymore. I've, I've already accomplished it all. To come to that attitude is to fire ourselves. You know, that's what they would do with the, with the potter. That the potter with the clay, he would take the clay when it, was, when it was what he wanted. He would put it in the kiln and it would become hard. But you know, after it was hardened, he couldn't reshape it. He couldn't demolish it. He couldn't even smash it into to dust and rework it. Once it was fired, once it had reached that point where it was, it was hardened, it couldn't be reshaped. And as long as we as Christians, if we ever get to that point where we are hardened, we can't be reshaped either. God says, don't you know that, that you know, as long as you are, are in my hands, I can rework you. I have a sovereign authority to rework you into what I want you to be if we will let him. That's the main difference between us and a real lump of clay. is that we actually have the choice to let God mold us or stay like we are. But here are the questions. We understand this concept of God as the potter. That God has the, the right to make us into whatever shape He needs us to be. If He needs a cup, He makes us into a cup. If he needs a plate, we're a plate. If he needs a bowl, we're a bowl. If he needs a firebox, we can be a firebox or a chamber pot or whatever it is that God needs. God will make us into that vessel if we will submit to him. But how does he mold us? Here you are upon the will of God as it spins before him. What tools is God using to mold you just came up with a couple of ideas, and I'm sure we can come up with a couple more if we thought about it longer. But I think one of the first things is, is that God uses His Word to shape our lives. It is a light unto a path, lamp unto my feet. It, is, it gives us the way that we should go. And so the Bible tells us what we ought to do. The Bible tells us what we ought not do. 
The Bible is molding us in the shape that God wants us to be. It is like the tool in His hand to make ridges or cuts or different shapes. We go back in, in, in time and we see over and over how the Bible has been there, God's Word has been used to shape people's lives. I think one of the first things we see in the Old Testament are the prophets. Repent, for God is coming. Those were the words of Jonah. Very much the same words of Jeremiah. Amend your ways. The words of the prophets speaking God's message would help shape and change lives during their day. The priests were tasked with educating the people so that they would know God's will. They were shaping the lives of men. Today, preachers who proclaim the Word of God continue to take God's sculpting power and change the lives of men. God's Word helps us to be formed by God into what He wants us to be. Conformed to the image of His Son. What else might we say, though? What else shapes us in this life? What does God use to put the rim on? Or what does God use to put ridges on the side? Or to form a base? What is it does God, that God uses? Well, He uses His Word. But I, I would say He also uses our experiences. You know, the, the things that happen to us each and every day of our lives. Uh, for example, here was this nation that, that had forgotten Him. Looked past Him. And He says, you know what? I'm going to have to send you into exile into captivity. The Babylonian nation came and, and imprisoned them and made them tribute to, to the nation of Babylon. It was one of the things that helped form their lives. You know, it's, it's interesting. You look prior to the Babylonian captivity and, and one of the sins that the nation of Israel was so guilty of was that of idolatry. And because of their idolatry, they were led into captivity. But you know, after captivity, well, the one you don't see very often in the, the prophets that are, are after that, that exile? Idolatry. Uh, they didn't become perfect people, but they at least learned their lesson that way. That experience helped shape who they were and who they were going to be. The period of the judges, that rise and fall, that ebb and flow of righteousness and favor with God and disfavor and unrighteousness. Here again, God uses the events and the experiences of their lives to shape them as a vessel unto God's use. And so the trials and, and the tribulations and the prosperity and the triumphs of our lives, all of them are used to shape who we are. And they're used by God. A little off here, a little more there, to make us in the image that God wants us to be. So the experiences from the time that we share together here uh, to, the, to, to the experiences we have at work or in school, all of those shape who we are. And God is using them to make us into what He wants us to be. A third thing that I, I think God uses to help shape us and form us are our relationships. We know in 1 Corinthians 15 that, that bad company can corrupt good morals. We understand those words. We understand that our relationships are going to impact us, either positively or negatively. And God is putting in our lives good people, honest people, Christians who love us, who love God. And, and that's going to help form who we need to be in the sight of God. He uses our friends. He uses co-workers. He uses complete strangers sometimes. Our spouses and our children, all of them, uh, come together as different people in our lives and, and bring us different messages and different reminders of God's love, of what parenthood is, what friendship is, of what being a neighbor to a complete stranger means. Those relationships, the people He puts in our lives, are one of the tools that God uses to help mold us. And then finally, as far as the list that I have, and again, we could, we could find many more, but these, these are all important to us. The church. The fellowship and the worship and the involvement and service that we have in the church, all is God, 
God's way or all are God's way of forming us into what He wants us to be. If we are malleable. And that's one of the important things. Are you a vessel that has submitted to control of God? That is still upon the wheel as God is turning? You see, for the Christian, the fire comes at death. For the one who loves God, fire does not come. The hardening does not come. The setting of the vessel does not come until life is over but as long as we are here if we are young if we are old if we are new Christians if we are mature Christians there's always more to learn let's keep ourselves on the will of God and let him use his grace and and his sovereignty to shape us into what he needs and not what we think he needs are you still on the will of God? That's the question we've got to ask. If you've not even been put on, if you're the lump of clay that's still on the shelf and you need to be prepared and put up on the wheel so God can shape you, and you need to obey the gospel, then, then all things are ready for you to obey the gospel this morning. Be baptized for the remission of your sins and God will kick the wheel off. But maybe you're starting to dry out, harden a little bit, get crusty. Isn't it time to let God rework us into the image that He wants us to be? Oh, He wants you so badly. And if you're willing to submit to Him, we ask you to come while we stand and while we sing.